Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you had a wonderful lunch break uh, with lots of interesting uh, discussions after we already had wonderful workshops this morning um, where we learned a lot. Um, so welcome to the Civil Society and Think Tank Forum, um, which is uh, an official part of the Berlin process. And it's lovely to see so many of you here today. Almost every seat is filled. And it's so nice to have all of you here not just virtually, but in person. Um, you, the civil society organizations who are here today, we present a wide range um, of different actors and different topics, including environment, energy, rule of law, democracy, EU integration, media, economy, and many more. And this uh, represents and reflects the broad aspect and the broad um, a wide range of topics we have placed um, on the agenda of the Civil Society Forum, um, but also which are on the agenda of the Berlin process. It is also a great pleasure welcoming the government representatives from the Western Balkans, but also from the German government uh, here today um, and also um, tomorrow. And we would very much like to thank the uh, German Federal Foreign Office uh, for the kind support um, of this process. We would obviously not be here without the great and strong interest of the German coalition government in the Western Balkans. Um, last year around this time, we were all not so sure what is going to happen with the process. And we were all, and I'm pretty sure you as well, were wondering what is going to happen after the elections. Is there still going to be the same interest? And I think we feel, and I hope you do too, that there is the same interest and maybe even more. Um, and this is why we are very happy um, about the support and the very, very strong cooperation um, with the Federal Foreign um, Office. Um, as you see, and as I already said, almost every seat um, is filled, which shows there's also a lot of interest um, from the region um, itself. Um, we have more than 100 participants today, and we certainly also hope that this is not a one-off, um, that you are going to stay connected, that we are going to stay connected, and that we find um, a framework um, which carries beyond these two days um, and creates um, long-lasting networks um, which uh, will have an impact in the region, but also certainly which will have a big impact within the European Union and also um, in, Germany, in Germany here. Um, and um, it is a, a wonderful opportunity to cooperate with you again, Christian, um, last year we were in the lead, this year you are in the lead, um, and um, I can say, and I hope you agree, I mean, you can disagree, but not now, you can do so afterwards, that this has been a very fruitful um, uh, cooperation between the Aspen Institute Germany and the Southeast uh, Europe Association, the SOG. Um, it has been a wonderful cooperation in the past and is also um, this year. Um, and um, I'm sure that if you haven't met all our teams, um, you will do so over the course um, of this day and tomorrow. And um, it is, you know, all those people working behind the scenes, they really make the show run. Um, so I will all, we will thank them in the end again, but they are all, already deserve a big thank you for all the effort um, they put into um, the preparation of this conference. Um, and many of you already participated in the preparatory conference in our digital meeting, um, where we had a lot of topics already on the agenda. But we also, may, you may remember, we did a little bit of a polling, which uh, topics interest you most and why you are participating um, in this endeavor. And uh, many of you said, because we want to give the Western Balkans a stronger voice in the European Union and also here in Germany. And this is what we aspire to do today and tomorrow by creating a platform um, where you can give your worries, your aspirations, your ideas, um, a platform for uh, communication, um, for developing new ideas, um, and to develop um, concrete and actionable recommendations, and also to hold all of those um, who do the policies on their tippy toes um, and remind them what you have already recommended in the past, what they signed up to, and what needs to be um, Im implemented. And the uh, 
topics um, on the agenda are, as I already said, manifold, but I want to remind us um, uh, the, um, of the uh, topics of our working groups, which um, are and were the green agenda, energy transition, climate change, protection of the environment, and uh, environmentally sustainable development, EU integration in a changing geopolitical environment, the information disorder, infrastructure investments, amplifying Roma voices in policy making, rule of law and fighting corruption, regional economic cooperation, and reconciliation. So a broad agenda, and you've been working hard um, developing recommendations, um, which some of them were already presented to the foreign ministers, and some of them are going to be represented um, in the uh, chancellery on Thursday. So we are very much looking forward to the next couple of days. Um, and with this, I'm handing over to you, Christian. Um, thank you so much um, that we again can be partner of you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stormy. Um, I must say that it has been really, again, a pleasure uh, working together, and it has been a real team effort in the best sense to um, make this event work and, and put it together, uh, combining all the efforts that we can make to realize such a big event with our teams. So thank you for this, and thank you all for being here. Um, it's really glad to finally see you in person again, uh, not only after the virtual workshop, was, which was already quite productive, um, but also after two years of the pandemic. So um, it's really a pleasure to um, being able to be host, not only as a Zoom host, but as a real host here in Berlin um, and to have you all together. And um, especially against the backdrop of the situation of the past two years and the lack of meetings that we were facing there, we thought really hard about how can we make this uh, event uh, work and how can we make it beneficial both for you as participants as well as for the Berlin process in general. Um, so we decided for a specific structure, um, a bit similar like last year where we started with an online preparatory workshop to really work on recommendations led by um, our great working group rapporteurs and moderators uh, who would structure the debate, uh, write introduction papers and eventually uh, collect the recommendations of civil society that are discussed uh, today and that will also be presented um, at the Berlin Process uh, Summit for the leaders. So, um, uh, in the meantime, as Tommy already mentioned, we uh, uh, had the chance to present uh, some of the results also at the meeting of Ministers of Foreign Affairs. Um, two of our representatives were there and um, uh, had a chance to get more attention to the results of the online workshop. Um, we're going to discuss the results in more detail now with uh, decision makers, with officials, as well as with US civil society representatives. And this will always be the case during the panel discussion. If you have looked at our program closely, we have uh, the panels and uh, the spotlights, uh, how we call them, and the panels will be the place to discuss the most recent recommendations that we worked on in the online preparatory workshop. And these will always start with the presentation of the recommendations, followed up by a discussion uh, of the officials and the others present on the panel, um, discussing them and uh, giving their feedback. Of course, um, as already mentioned, uh, after last year's uh, civil society forum, we did not forget about the results from this one because um, maybe unfortunately uh, most of the recommendations are still valid to this day. And um, we follow up on these recommendations in the spotlight discussions, um, which are mostly focusing on issue, issues where we had the feeling we don't really need a new working group on this now because the recommendations are still up to date. We rather have to have a closer look where we stand now and what is the state of implementation of recommendations. And um, we will try to do this during the spotlight discussions. Um, so what is, what is almost most important uh, to us here is, of course, to value the knowledge of all people in the room. And usually this is the problem because you only have a limited number of people who can be in the panel. But this is uh, why we decided for a fishbowl format for all the panels that will include the discussion of recommendations, which are the panels that uh, have a longer duration in time. And uh, this means that if you feel like you would like to contribute with a statement or with a question to the panel, you can just take 
uh, the empty seat on the panel and uh, give your input as soon as the moderator gives you the word, of course, and um, uh, contribute in this way uh, your, your knowledge to the panel. Of course, you will have to leave after this because uh, somebody else will take your seat, hopefully. Um, but I think this is a, a very good way of bringing more people um, into the discussion and uh, to highlighting the knowledge of all those who are present. There's, of course, also the possibility to uh, give your knowledge to the spotlights. This will be from, um, uh, from the auditorium uh, with microphones that um, our, our team members will hand you uh, as soon as you raise your hands. Um, so with, with raise your hands, one thing is left from the Zoom experience <laughs> somehow. Um, also, we have a second element. Um, most of you experienced already this morning, these are the workshop sessions that we are having during the morning hours where we try to put together workshops on issues that, uh, from our point of view, should interest um, a great variety of different civil society organizations. And um, yes, I was, uh, I was really amazed to see that this morning almost every seat was filled. So thank you very much for this great interest. Uh, as for this great interest in this panel, and um, I'm really looking forward also to the workshop sessions tomorrow. Um, finally, um, just one more point. I would really like to ask you to plan for nothing else while you're staying here in Berlin, because we're going to have two excellent networking dinners tonight and tomorrow evening, uh, which will give you a great opportunity to discuss the topics of the day, um, to get feedback on your own ideas in a more informal manner, and I think this is a really great opportunity also overcoming the Zoom fatigue and meeting again and uh, yeah, sharing your knowledge and making new contacts. Uh, so now I'm really much, very much looking forward to the exchange with all of you in the, uh, today and tomorrow in the two conference days. And I hand over to the video statement of our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Annalena Baerbock. Thank you very much. A warm welcome to you at the Civil Society Forum. It's great to have you in Berlin. When I became German Foreign Minister last year, one of my first trips abroad was to the Western Balkans. And I vividly recall the meetings I had with you, representatives of civil society, with journalists who work with great determination to get to the bottom of corruption cases, with activists who search for missing persons and promote reconciliation, between former enemies. The work of civil society is crucial. I'm convinced that foreign policy is about more than context between ministers and capital. It's also about facilitating exchange between students or academics. It's about listening to the ideas of researchers and activists. And in many cases, it's such input that makes us in government realize there is an issue that we should take up with our counterparts at our next meeting, or a fresh idea that can help us resolve a diplomatic impasse. That's why the Civil Society Forum is and will remain at the core of the Berlin process. Together, we are united by one goal, bringing your countries into the European Union. For this, we need your insights and your criticism and we're privileged to support your work. From youth exchanges to climate protection to defending independent journalists. That's all the more important at a time when Russia, with its aggression against Ukraine, has brought war back to the European continent. President Putin is attacking everything we believe in. Freedom, democracy, and human rights. Many of you experience the horrors and war yourself in the Western Balkans just over 20 years ago. You know what it feels like when mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers will never hug their children, their siblings again. That's why I'm grateful that you have been making your voices heard against Russia's war and its brutal violence and for European future for the Western Balkans, where children, women and men can live in freedom and in peace together. Yes, reconciliation takes time. European integration takes time. But I'm deeply convinced that together we can build this European future together.
fantastic. It seems like we're all here. Can you hear me well? The audience online? Yeah, a nod. Great, thank you. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the first panel today, panel on the energy transition and energy security in time of crisis. My name is Salma Shehovic. I'm project manager within the FES SOE office uh, in Sarajevo, and I'll be your moderator for today. Uh, our panelist speakers are joining us online and in person. They don't need much of an introduction, but still it's customary, so I'm going to go ahead and read, uh, tell you a bit about their um, careers. With us today from Federal Foreign Office, Ms. Christiane Hulman, who heads the division on the Western Balkans. Christiane is a lawyer by training who studied in Bonn and Geneva. She's been with the Foreign Office since 2003 and has worked all over the world from Kiev to New York and has been heading or working on the Western Balkans since 2016. Her work focuses on human rights, immigration, but also privacy rights in digital age and right to water and sanitation. Welcome. That was before. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, today with us, one of the Western Balkan natives who made it big, Sonia Risteska, program manager in the Powering Past Co Alliance, focusing on developing broader engagement within the PPCA and its members and partners through various content-related activities, bringing the Alliance membership closer to, the, to their call phase-out targets. She's working on establishing PPCA thought leadership in the call to clean the debates before uh, working for, or joining the Power Pass Call Alliance. You all know her as a brilliant manager within the Agora Energy Vende. Sonia, welcome to you too. Thank you. Today with us in person as well is our CSO rapporteur, Mr. Jovan Rajcic, an attorney from Serbia specializing in energy and environmental law with more than a decade of a professional experience, including working for best of the law firms in Serbia and before founding RERI, which is Renewables and Environmental Regulatory Institute, which was founded in 2017 with the main idea to establish unique regional legal and policy think tank. Jovan also worked uh, with highly reputable clients and multinational corporations in on some projects that include pioneering renewable energy projects in Serbia and Montenegro. Welcome to you. And online, we are joined by Dr. Dirk Buschle, a man often in legal community, anyways, referred as energy law. Guru, Dr. Bushle, welcome. Dirk Bushle is a deputy director of the Energy Community Secretariat and head of legal division. He's also a chairman of the Energy Community Dispute Resolution and Negotiation Center, where he is responsible for dispute resolution and, and negotiations uh, and has acted as a mediator in high profile investor state conflicts in the energy sector. Dr. Bushle is also active in academia and teaches European and international energy policy and governance. He is a graduate of Constance University in Germany, but has earned his PhD in Switzerland. He has widely published in different areas of European policy and law and has lectured at universities all over the Europe. Last but not least, we are joined by Mr. Andreas Scholle an engineer, a graduate from Technical University of Berlin, with more than 20 years of professional experience in the renewable energy sector. Mr. Scholle is Managing Director of WPD, Eastern Europe GmbH. And as for the format, even though Christian touched on the format, I will once again remind you that we're going to do a fishbowl, which is probably in addition to the speaker's best part of this um, discussion today, because it gives you a chance, all the audience, to act as panelists. So we have an empty seat, and I promise I'll move my papers for you to join with your questions or comments or otherwise, and contribute, give some flavor to this uh, discussion, and overall make it active. But please do so after the first round of Q&As uh, with our main panelists. Also, please limit 
your questions and comments to what was stated in the recommendations, just so we can all stay uh, on the same page. Okay, so for starters, we gonna go with the recommendations, and I'll ask Mr. Jovan Beach to present us recommendations um, within those 10 minutes, right? I'm sorry, what? Afterwards, I planned that, yeah? Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yes, Mr. Reich, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank the organizers, and of course, big thank to all participants of our working group. I think the uh, discussion was very productive. I think the conclusions are as sharp as they can be, and uh, that we get some, some concrete suggestions and recommendations, so I hope there will be a will from all stakeholders to do the joint work, which will eventually gain to some progress when we see each other next year. So to start with the current situation and the obstacles that we are facing right now as a region, it is a joint conclusion of our working group that we cannot talk about acceleration of the energy transition in the Western Balkans. We can talk about commencement of the energy transition at the Western Balkans. We see a lack of strategic orientation of the regional governments and of the decision makers concerning the orientation towards the energy transition. Uh, we see lack of a strategy, clear strategy, realistic strategy, and we see the lack of will for, for, for that. Uh, also, we are missing a comp comprehensive approach. Uh, energy transition is not only about the energy, it's about redefining the entire system, the entire economy. It's about redefining social, economic, educational aspects, and this is something that we don't see, unfortunately, happening at the moment. We also had a different opinions and the different points uh, within the group, how much the states and the governments should be involved in this process and what will be consequences in case we let the energy transition be market driven as it is, uh, as, as it seems it will be at the moment. What will, will be the consequences uh, in the economic sense, in the social sense, uh, and uh, what will be the final outcome in that case. Uh, also, a very important question was restructuring of coal regions. We heard from, for some examples, negative examples from Greece. Uh, so, uh, the, I would say, uh, 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 dominant opinion was that, uh, of course, except for the funds that are needed for this, combined funds, bo both from the EU and from the national uh, budgets, uh, what is necessary is the inclusion of all stakeholders, including CSOs, including unions, uh, including individuals, who are uh, uh, experts in the field. They should not be taken as an enemies of the governments, but as uh, somebody who can contribute to have the best possible uh, solutions at the end of the process. We emphasize the rule of law as something which is most significant in the entire process and which we lack at the moment, unfortunately. Uh, increase of transparency, compliance, the states with their obligations, competition principles, public procurements, and uh, uh, everything that makes uh, uh, um, economy and the market um, uh, reliable and, and uh, uh, um, competitive 
we believe there is a lot of room and a lot of improvements to be made. Public participation is also uh, designated as one of the major problems. Uh, when we talk about strategic documents and strategic orientation of the governments, and also when we're talking about the monitoring of the processes in development of the energy projects uh, in the region. We talked a lot about the reg regional cooperation, but uh, we were talking about rethinking the models for regional cooperation. We don't need more organizations. We don't need more, uh, we were talking this, more, this morning, as a matter of fact, about networking. We are not talking about the official networks. We are talking about the platform that will enable to have a meaningful conversation and that will uh, enable that each voice will be heard and analyzed and taken into consideration. So, uh, also from the, from the perspective of the markets, of the practical issues, I would say, we were talking about a necessity to merge regional electricity uh, markets with the, with the European, with the European mar markets. Also, we had a special set of recommendations related to energy community, so I'm very glad that Mr. Bouchelet is also uh, on the panel, we are aware, uh, we are aware that uh, uh, energy community has uh, uh, limited authorizations when we talk about the enforcement, when we talk about, let's say, in a wider sense, judiciary uh, authorizations. However, we believe that current tools and current uh, possibilities uh, to react should, should be improved and utilized uh, more efficiently. Uh, we also believe that when estimating achievements of the governments in the region related to their activities, wider specter of analysis should be undertaken. I will, I will take chance to have only one example here uh, with the National Emission and Reduction Plan in Serbia, which was adopted with a pretty much delay for a couple of years, and it is indeed a good thing that it was adopted. The problem is it was adopted too late. It was adopted in a uh, wrong, I wouldn't say illegal form, but wrong form, and it is a problem that is abridged during previous period. So um, when we're estimating achievements of the governments related to energy transition and we, when uh, we're talking about alignment of the EU framework, then I think the wider perspective should be uh, taken into consideration. Uh, this year we had only one uh, recommendation for the governments in the region, only one, and that is to comply with the obligations that were undertaken. If that is fulfilled, by the governments, then we will have less problems. I'm, sure, I'm sorry that the panel is missing or some of the representatives of the governments, although they were invited, but then the, the fact that we have only one recommendation for them, it's self-explainable. So, uh, of course, at the end, uh, let's not forget CSOs and the think tanks, we should be self-criticized before everything to ourselves. We believe that we need, as I said at the beginning, when I was talking about platform from, for communication, we have to be part of building, of establishing this platform. We have to offer solution. We have to suggest how we see it, and then we can request for support from other st stakeholders uh, we also need more proactive approach. Uh, it is not only, a, a, only about us and up to us, but we have to do our best to be recognized as a partners in the process. So to conclude with a uh, uh, thought of Professor Mirza Kuslugic, who was part of our group, but he's not here in Berlin today. I don't know if he's online, but... Uh, um, 
as he said, uh, energy transition of the Europe will not be possible without the energy transition of Western Balkans, especially when we consider uh, the problems coming from Western Balkans, uh, power plants coming from Western Balkans and the pollution they make. So I have to say this is our joint problem mm -hmm. and we will have to look for the solution jointly. Thank you. Wonderful, just in time. And thank you so much for mentioning the missing governmental <laughs> representatives. I'm tempted to say it's a reflection of their relation to the CSOs, but I'm gonna be nice and assume they're busy working on the energy transition. Um, and now about the video, because visuals are powerful and always, uh, or most of the time good, in this case definitely, let's watch a short video made by Deutsche Welle on this topic. Najčešće na terenu naiđete na problem da, ok, imamo zakon o planiranju izgradnje, zakon o energetici, zakon o obnovljivim izvorima energije, imamo konkretan projekat, ali imamo recimo lokalnu administraciju koja nije obučena. Ona radi neke svakodnevne poslove i ne stiže da se obuči oko novih zakonskih rešenja i načina njihove primjene. I sad se prvi put susretne sa nečim potpuno novim. Oni ne znaju kako da postupaju. ove zemlje izolovano jedna u odnosu na drugi na drugu su kako da kažem sve će im biti puno teže integracija otvaranje zemalja i čvršće povezivanje regiona pravi jako dobru osnovu za za ovaj povećanje sigurnosti energetske sigurnosti i umanjenje troškova proizvodnje energije ili jeftiniju energiju u celom regionu Thank you. Okay, let's start with the questions. Um, in one of the early drafts of recommendations, it was recommended that the energy community secretariat acts as a bridge between the CSOs and the EU. So Dr. Busher, over to you. Are the energy transition and energy security two sides of the same coin? And if yes, what are the barriers to accelerated deployment of renewables in the Western Balkans? Thanks a lot, Selma, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, very happy not only to be present here today with you virtually, but also about the orientation of this year's uh, edition of the Berlin process. We uh, indeed are tackling something um, that I would fully subscribe uh, two sides of the same coin, that's the energy transition and energy security. In the Western Balkans, uh, as much and maybe even more as in the rest of Europe, leaders are under the impression of the price surge and uh, the fact that leaders will tomorrow, um, excuse me, day after tomorrow, discuss precisely these two topics, transition and crisis. And it's not just a matter for the ministers in charge of energy, but it has been ele elevated to the highest possible level is already a good sign of the will to tackle both problems and the priority that they should and have in the Western Balkans uh, leaderships. Um, I think it is also important that, uh, because the energy community has mentioned that we get out of uh, our normal logic. Our normal logic would be to wait until the European Union has taken decisions on how to respond to both crises, the price surge and the climate crisis, and then adopt them in the energy communities only years later. I think the urgency of both issues uh, show that this is not and should not be possible anymore. That's also an important element of European integration to take decisions jointly and to 
follow up on them jointly as well. I think um, when I listen to the recommendations that uh, Jovan has reported, I would um, subscribe uh, evidently to most of them. Maybe I would be a bit less skeptical about one element that you mentioned, uh, the transition being market driven. Uh, I think there's uh, a lot uh, to be argued in favor of a market based uh, approach. Evidently, that does not mean that the governments should be left and released uh, of their responsibility, quite the contrary. I think um, Another element that has already been mentioned uh, is indeed in this respect very important. It's uh, the integration of the markets. Uh, and this is precisely the precondition for making renewables and investing in renewables more uh, attractive. This will happen hopefully in December this year at the Energy Community Ministerial Council, which will adopt a big package uh, allowing for market coupling and other features, not only inside and within the region, but also with the European Union. So in this respect, uh, the Western Balkan countries will be integrated as if they were member states. Uh, when we're talking about reform, necessary reforms, some of them have already started. That's a reorientation of the support schemes for renewables. Um, there are still a couple of tricky issues and very often we face um, a debate about uh, the need to be bankable for projects on the one hand, and on the other hand, to let the market operate and not to intervene um, beyond what is necessary. As an example, uh, I could mention, for instance, the balancing responsibility to be put on investors. Uh, I'm not going to go into details, but that's definitely something where we have to find also uh, commonly agreed and workable solutions uh, as a, um, an instrument to make investment in renewables more attractive. We can also and should not uh, shy away from reforms that go further. I'm talking here about also something that has proved to be very painful in the past, the reform of retail prices, which are very low. Um, and of course, now in, the, in times of price surge, uh, uh, governments uh, try to stick to the low retail prices uh, despite they become under pressure. But we should not forget that high prices, at least cost reflective prices, also send an important signal to save energy in the first place, but also for renewables um, to make a profit um, on their investment. I think for this sake, we need a price reform which does not mean that prices have to increase for everybody, but that support provided by governments is more targeted for those who are really in need and give an incentive to save energy on the one hand and to invest in renewables on the other hand. For this, um, I think we, and I would fully subscribe to that, we need a more strategic approach also on the side of governments. The NECP that has been mentioned is the tool to actually provide this holistic and strategic approach. I fully agree that it has to be done right um, and not just another piece of paper produced that is not being followed up. Um, I also and further would believe that we are lagging in the Western Balkans still behind some of the instruments deployed in the European Union. Um, we feel the consequences of this absence. I'm thinking here about carbon prices and the CBAM that is being currently discussed and finalized on the European Union side. It would be much, much better if we had a carbon price regionally coordinated uh, in the Western Balkan 6 to make sure that the revenue generated from pricing carbon also stays in the Western Balkan 6 and is not just transferred to Brussels. We also, um, and that's the essence of a declaration that leaders are supposed to sign, uh, not to sign, to agree on um, at the Berlin summit on Thursday. We also believe that more regionalization is needed. No country uh, is big enough in the Western Balkans to shoulder the burden of the transition by itself. That needs outside finance for sure, but it also needs a more 
regional thinking of the energy transition. I'm thinking here about instruments such as uh, guarantees of origins on which we are working, so a certificate system that allows trade within the countries, but also with the European Union. I'm thinking about using flexibility mechanisms and instruments more effectively, um, including potentially also regional, region-wide capacity mechanisms. I'm thinking about um, joint regional planning. An NECP is a good instrument, but the issue with it is the N, the capital N, because they remain regional. I think at some point we need to complement those by a regional NECP for the entire Western Balkans. And probably this also would require a regional approach to phasing out coal so that not a single country is being left alone with this very painful um, decision. And of course, uh, final uh, recommendation or final response to recommendations uh, that Jovan has made and mentioned is the um, adherence to the rule of law um, and the strengthening of uh, not only the enforcement mechanism, but to contracting parties, as we call them, Western Balkans uh, countries, taking their obligations, their commitments more seriously. There, you're evidently bre breaching to a converted. We have been pushing for such uh, strengthening in various form for a long time. It has proved to be very difficult um, because countries and their governments feel that to take the responsibility of not complying with the commitments made uh, can be a painful consequence of actually not living up to what has been promised has been promised not only to the energy community, but to society as a whole. And that's why we are for the time being left with the instruments that we have. I'm very happy that the um, civil society organizations are those who use these instruments best, even in their limited scope and with their limited impact. And I think there we can also do more jointly in the future. Um, the energy community, as you know, can decide whether a country or not has been in breach of its commitments. I'm thinking here of cases like the Tuzla 7 power plant in Bosnia and Herzegovina and others. Um, <coughs> in the absence of a strict enforcement mechanism of penalties, we have to rely also on your action on the ground. Uh, these decisions can be taken to national courts. These can, decisions can be used in what has been called all over the world climate justice um, and private enforcement. Um, we are still waiting and, of course, um, very um, interested also in getting engaged in these kind of cases uh, taking shape in the uh, Western Balkan region as well. It's not everything to be expected, neither from financial donors, nor from the governments, nor from international organizations. We try to play the part as good as we can, um, but I think only together, and that reinforces the message that has already been sent, uh, all together in everybody using the instruments at their disposal, uh, we can actually push for this transition to happen faster, to happen fairer, and to happen in a more controlled manner and uh, in this spirit of cooperation I'm evidently looking forward uh, for the next steps following this edition of the Berlin process and uh, as always um, very much happy to cooperate with all of you um, on the on these next steps thanks a lot yeah, thank you thank you Dr. Bush and also for also always being available uh, and accessible to us. Uh, Ms. Holman, your position today is probably least flattering. If you think of the recommendations, the list was almost entirely directed to the EU or the member states. Um, and we all know that those uh, recommendations are not easily implementable. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I'm gonna ask you, were you surprised by either the number of recommendations or the type of recommendations, for example, we all know that the current German government places um, a lot of attention on climate change matters, and there were no recommendations or any sort of mentioning on climate change matters in our recommendations. 
Are you surprised by that or again by the number of recommendations? Thank you so much, Sana. And first of all, um, thank you. Hello, everybody, and uh, good afternoon. And uh, let me start by expressing my gratitude to the Southeast Europe Association and the Aspen Institute Berlin for organizing this great um, civil society forum already the second year in a row, this time in, in person. It's uh, wonderful to see uh, this uh, room packed of people and others present online. Um, and uh, it's really our um, our pleasure to, um, uh, to support this event, uh, which is very timely, um, we, f we feel. Um, I heard with great interest the recommendations, um, Jovan, you just mentioned. I must say I can very much subscribe to these recommendations. I think they are, and um, I think as I, if I understood correctly, it was one single recommendation actually follow, I mean, fulfill your obligations, right? <laughs> this is, I think, a very um, clear um, recommendation, which is, is, is true and should be um, um, a, a, a guideline for any, any, any politician, any, any state. If you made a commitment, you should uh, fulfill it afterwards. Um, the um, recommendations um, or the, 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 the aspects you pointed out and also um, uh, the, the topics of, uh, of a green agenda and energy transition are uh, so high on this year's Berlin process agenda because uh, they're not nice to have topics, but they're a must. And um, uh, the, the very good uh, short video we just uh, saw, I think, uh, uh, underscores this. Uh, it shows both the potential um, uh, tr transition has and also the harm if uh, it isn't um, implemented. And uh, with the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine, it, uh, the vulnerabilities and dependencies have become uh, so evident um, uh, that um, all countries uh, in, uh, I would, would say almost in the world, but at least in, 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 in Europe, are striving now to make this uh, transition as, as, as fast as, as possible. A good um, news is that uh, the EU and the Western Balkans um, uh, are facing this challenge together and uh, are there in solidarity. And I think the, um, the emergency response package also Ursula von der Leyen has just announced in the region, uh, and this will certainly also be a topic at the, at the summit, uh, gives testimony of that. So, um, of course, we need short-term relief for price surges and shortages, but um, this is um, not enough. We also need um, a clear rollout of, of, of renewables um, and, and energy transition. Um, already in 2020, two years ago, as you all know, the Western Balkan Six uh, committed to the Green Agenda at the SOFIA Summit, which is a very good document. So there you have sort of the, also part of the commitments which, which Jovan mentioned. Um, and as um, we've seen in the video, and, and, and you know, the, the great um, potential of, of, of the region also uh, should be a um, reason for, for every uh, politician in, in, in the countries to sort of make this uh, a priority, a priority as it is also in Germany at the moment. Um, we are also um, undergoing um, this transition, which of course has started years ago, but now um, we are, I would not only say redoubling, re tripling our efforts to, to get there because the high de dependency on, 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 on gas, on gas from Russia is, is um, now um, uh, becoming uh, very damaging for, for our industry. And um, we've also, um, I think, all um, realized now that energy uh, will not get cheaper, fossil energy. So we need to, to get a cheap and safe energy and this can only come uh, from renewables also energy uh, with which we cannot be blackmailed. This is also, of course, an, an, an important um, factor. Um, in the uh, Western Balkans, there's great potential for, for solar, for photovoltaics and uh, other, um, and also hydro. Um, and uh, the potential is so big that you could even become an exporter of energy. And this makes just uh, so much uh, sense. You mentioned uh, coal, um, Mines also. I was uh, in um, Pristina last um, week together with State Minister Lührmann and we visited a project which is, uh, will be um, set up on the fields of a used coal mine uh, just uh, behind the big <laughs> two um, um, power plants, which uh, sort of are very, very harmful, therefore, for in, in terms of pollution. 
Um, and this is a great project because you use uh, the territory of, uh, which is already sort of there. It's been used um, uh, for, or cannot be used otherwise. It's connected to the grid and there's a lot of space. You don't have uh, also neighbors, people whose um, uh, sort of, uh, of um, territory and um, uh, state is concerned. So there we think we w would can only encourage the governments to uh, to focus on, on on these projects, which in a small country like Kosovo, for example, can make a big difference. In spring, uh, Minister Baerbock, who just gave the video greeting, she was also in Kosovo and opened a wind park um, in, in in the northern part of Kosovo. Um, if it um, works at maximum capacity, it can provide energy for 10% of all Kosovo households. This is a lot. So. Um, and um, apart from uh, that, um, energy transition uh, will provide uh, good jobs, um, uh, jobs which are sort of um, uh, modern jobs, which are um, in demand also elsewhere. It's uh, jobs and technology. There's a lot of, one can also say that money around, money that wants to be invested in, in these areas. Also monies from EU company. There are many funds, international funds that use for uh, that are looking for investments, green investments. So there's also uh, there's no shortage of money for for projects. But we need to sort of um, a good framework, and of course investors need um, security that um, sort of the rules of the game um, will not change. I do not have to talk about air pollution and, and environmental harms and hazards. You, are, you all live in the, in the region. And I can say last week in Pristina, the air was already quite bad. In Belgrade, where we went afterwards, we were lucky to have very warm weather. So the heating wasn't on. We, we met there. So um, this was good. But um, I mean, Belgrade is, is also uh, very high um, when it comes to the rankings of the most polluted cities, which is a sad ranking. And um, there's. Um, this, of course, uh, is in the interest of, of um, should in be in the interest of everyone in the country to change that as quickly as possible. Um, uh, Mr. Bushler also mentioned the uh, sort of ongoing um, uh, talks about uh, reforming EU legislation, also in terms of um, how to price uh, products that are imported to the EU and to f uh, factor in also the aspect of sort of the carbon footprint that. Um, and this is something which will also become very important for the region because this will be an, an added price uh, to products which will be, will, which will not be produced in a green way. And this is, uh, is important because, uh, as, as you all know, um, when it comes to selling products, um, uh, the uh, buyers are very price-driven. And if there's all of a sudden an addition to, to a price, which then makes it more expensive than uh, a product from somewhere else, this can be decisive. So also that should be a big um, incentive um, uh, to move on. We are very happy that we can, with the Berlin process, um, uh, push this debate a little bit and um, add focus to that. Um, because I would say from the conversations we have with politicians in the region, um, the topic has, is there and uh, politicians are um, very much aware um, but um, I think more needs to be done than to sort of get to the level of implementation and also to tackle this um, yeah, uh, comprehensive framework, sometimes uh, cut red tape mm -hmm. and um, get the projects going. I must say also we have the same uh, situation in Germany. I, or had it, it's not always easy. It takes time because you also have to see uh, their different interests. Um, uh, projects also have sort of uh, affect people, people who live close by. Also here in Germany, when we put up a wind farm, you have people who would like it to be somewhere else because they live next doors. So all these are issues, of course, uh, which also uh, must, must be part of the rules. But you, in the end, it's important that we all find ways um, to, to balance this, uh, but then also get into the implementation stage um, as, as, as quickly as possible. Thank you so much. Yeah, wonderful. No, thank you. Um, I'm glad we didn't go overboard with our list of recommendations. And now you can expect us to, you know, bug you with the implementation or at least hear from us. You'll definitely hear from us. Um, over to Ms. Risteska. Sonia, you work in North Macedonia. Then you moved to Germany to work with Agora on the Southeast Europe 
uh, matters. And now you're working for Powering Pascal mm -hmm. Alliance, taking more global views of it. And you have this perfect, well-rounded perspective. But seriously, <laughs> uh, Pascal, right? So please tell us, how does the goal of the Alliance, um, how is it perceived given the crisis time? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Selma. Yes, I mean, thank you really for, for inviting me here as well. Um, and yes, I mean, just maybe as a um, first statement would be that these are not just the problems that the Western Balkans are facing. It's really currently a worldwide issue when it comes to energy commodities mm -hmm. and uh, accessibility and uh, how expensive they are. Um, so absolutely, the region, it's, it's, it's not alone. And who will be the winner and loser from, from the crisis, of course, it, it remains to be seen. Um, uh, we as an alliance uh, are now currently cel celebrating our fifth year anniversary. Um, and it's a platform which was created in 2017 uh, at that COP by the Canadian and the UK governments uh, to serve basically as a platform for um, stakeholders, national, subnational level, utilities, uh, finance, et cetera, um, who wants to get out of coal um, um, by a certain year for the OECD countries, for instance, uh, 2030, and for the non-OECD, of course, a bit, a bit later, because we do recognize the challenges that, that exist um, uh, in the way. Um, what is, because um, our main role is to uh, have power uh, system uh, or power sector uh, in all the countries in the world, in the world that uh, do not rely on coal specifically, that we don't have coal anymore as one of the major culprits for climate change. Um, and we see now with the energy crisis how challenging this can be in many of the places, even in, in, in the global north, right? And, and how the utilization of coal has been increasing. Um, and uh, for all this, our message uh, remains the same. This is temporary and it's because See, there was not enough investment beforehand in alternative resources that we are facing this now. That the crisis, that the price surge, that inflation is driven by fossil fuels. And that's why we need to accelerate the move away from coal towards clean, clean technologies. And um, of course our role is to support uh, all the stakeholders who are going through this process. Um, I don't have anything else to add on the recommendations, really. I mean, they're all right like in, in place. Um, they, are, they, are, they are the right recommendations that we need to accelerate it. it needs, there, we need regionalization. We need to cut red tape. Uh, we need to enable uh, the system to function no more uh, centralized with one coal-fired power plant. We need flexible grids. We need smart grids. We need digitalization. Uh, we need more prosumers. We need um, uh, households who are active in the market. Uh, all of this, it's, it's needed. Um, and uh, of course, uh, our role, at least as, a, as an alliance, is to support, um, um, as I said, whether it's a government or a region or even a utility, uh, to get there. And also to, to link that to, to the proper finance, because finance still remains an issue. Uh, we saw there is enough maybe funding or capital out there, but then you come to a specific region or specific countries, um, uh, which are perceived as more risky, and then there is an issue of how to actually lower that risk so they can have, um, um, let's say, more, especially foreign, uh, foreign investors coming and, and supporting the, the, energy, the energy transition. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't like uh, talk really too much. I, I do believe that it's important, um, um, as it was said, said before, um, that um, this is something that is quite known, uh, and, and the energy crisis um, can be really the instigator to finally accelerate the changes. So we need to also see the opportunity there and not just focus on the short term of, of dealing with the crisis, whether that's support for households, support for small and medium enterprises, of course, all that's very important, but to also really use the knowledge created now on how we are dealing with it to really accelerate towards uh, um, um, more cooperation, uh, exiting coal, clean technologies, cutting red tape, lowering the risk so we can have more, more capital investments, um, et cetera. So these are all like important things. Um, and we can only encourage the political elites in the different countries um, to really seize the opportunity. Um, but of course, whether that will happen, it remains uh, for them to decide. Thanks. Yeah, very political issue. 
Uh, okay, let's turn to the business sector now. It's always good to have an engineer, be it on the panel or uh, on the team. Mr. Cholet, um, you've been in the renewable energy or project development for years now, uh, over two decades. WPT worked, PD, uh, worked in Croatia, if I'm right, and um, I would imagine there are, is some interest of the investors um, for the potential that um, our region has. So when talking to the potential investors, what is it that they see as issues? What are the red flags? Yeah, thank investing. you very much. <laughs> thank you very much for this invitation and also giving a voice to the business. I mean, all what I have heard is what I can fully subscribe and understand. These are the topics. And maybe I can just illustrate how that feels from doing business in the region. Because um, we are, will probably not focus now on how to get a project ready to build, which is also quite complicated depending very much on the specific uh, regional approach. But uh, when we end up there with a project that could be implemented, then we are exactly uh, facing all these problems that we have heard before. So uh, usually we're talking about in long-term investment. We have payback periods uh, for the investment for, of several years. So it's nothing where you can just have a vision only for three, five years, and that's it. No, this is not working. We really have to have a long-term look mm -hmm. and have to have an understanding what we will earn, how our investment will pay back. And then what can we do? Um, usually in the past, we uh, were living up on feeding schemes, uh, like what we did in Croatia, but what was also introduced in several other countries in the region, so that we had a politically guaranteed payback of our investment. Um, this time is over, and I can say it's also right that these times are over because we don't need it. Uh, renewable energy, like wind and solar, are the cheapest sources of electricity. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that they will come automatically because they need also an environment which enables the investment. So when we are now looking into the market, we can still sell to the mostly dominant uh, state-owned utility, but then we are just... Uh, keeping this monopoly or what we are trying to see is that we are directly selling our electricity to consumers uh, in the first on the first hand we are looking for large consumers uh, industry and we see also a lot of interest especially now with the rising mm. prices and the energy deficits coming that uh, also the industry is very much interested to enter into long-term uh, relationship with a producer like us but um, then we come to the market environment in which this has to function. And um, I'm glad also Mr. Bushler already uh, pointed out to the topic of balancing responsibility. I think this is one of the key issues where we have to develop the markets uh, in order to cope with this problem. The problem is uh, that wind and solar will produce not always exactly as they are predicted to do so. So if there is a deviation in their production, who will cover this and at what costs? And here we need an understanding who is finally um, taking the cost of this deviation. Um, I can understand, and this was also a tendency in the past, uh, that this should be up to the producer, like us. Um, but we are facing the situation if we are working in a market where there is only few players that can offer these kind of market services, so additional production, and usually it's the uh, dominating state-owned utility, then they can also dictate prices. And once we have done our investment and others have done so, uh, they can easily earn on our shoulders. And this is something where we would like to have some security. So what we are currently doing is the opposite. So when we are talking to the industry, we make them understand, uh, yes, we are ready to take a balancing responsibility, but only with a limited scope, because uh, we see also in other markets where we entered into such delivery contracts that when we have to buy electricity in a market which is very short, then we are losing a lot of money. Uh, so this is not a business case that we can afford. And uh, so what the only thing we can offer is offering a limited scope of responsibility and uh, the rest unfortunately right now 
has to remain with the off-taker, so with the industry. The industry is thinking about that uh, because they understand uh, that also our potentials are limited. Uh, but this is something what we have to develop and especially develop means that we have to enlarge the market. I also heard this quite often already in the recent uh, presentations that regionalization is the key. I fully agree, uh, especially for uh, smaller countries like in the Western Balkans. I think this will help a lot if we can uh, regionalize the markets, if we can enlarge uh, the players on the market, because that would create much more transparency and efficiency in providing these, uh, this market environment that we as investors and also the industry as our off-takers need. Um, so I hope this gave uh, an insight from, from our uh, view as, as an investor. I would like to still point out a second uh, topic because uh, we all understand that rule, introducing rule of law, transparency, regionalization um, requires a lot of efforts, a lot of harmonizing between uh, countries that have different political mm -hmm. agendas. And on the same, in the same time, I see that there's one other energy resource still keeping uh, an economic advantage and that is coal. Uh, so we were just talking about uh, facing out coal and this was a topic also in the region for the last five to ten years i would say but i have the feeling this is now coming back uh, as the potential alternative and uh, i as developer and investor into renewables fear also this scenario that it might seem much more attractive to policymakers in the region to stick to coal to also uh, invest again into refitting of the existing coal power plants because it has a positive benefit on the coal industry in the region, and it is a domestic resource. It is comparably still very competitive. The only disadvantage is it contributes a lot to climate change. And I think this is where we are uh, also with this forum, where we, can, where we should really take into focus, this is a policy choice in the end. And uh, this is something that we should discuss and also maybe give uh, our input and maybe from European Union, from other uh, uh, finances, we can also give more incentives to really change this pattern and not remain with the old pattern, remain with fossil fuels, remaining with the old market. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Yes, definitely. It's a policy choice and short termism is very much present in our region, but also, like Sonia said, the rest of the world as well. Okay, now it's time for fishbowl. Like we said in the beginning, whoever wishes to make a comment or a statement is welcome to join us here and limit their comment or intervention to one comment or one statement and in relation to what we heard. So anyone, going once, going twice, come on CSOs. You were quite loud during the preparatory meetings. <laughs> nope, nope. Okay, fine. Thing I why can I just say wh why we, we are breaking the ice? Just mm -hmm. to, 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 to add two sentences to what Andreas said. I would just, uh, uh, what he said in the end, <clears throat> it's a policy choice. I don't think it's a policy choice. I think it was a policy choice and we made the choice. When we, when we agreed to, 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 to Green Agenda, when we signed, as we said, when we undertake the obligation, we made the choice then. So now it's only about how we will enforce what we obliged ourselves to do. This is a choice. Uh, how we can, in the best possible way, execute these obligations that we undertake. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Andreas, I don't know if, if that was the point or, or I misunderstood, but it just flash me in the brain immediately, as you said it so. <laughs> if I may just respond, I think you're fully right. It was a policy choice and everything was already on track, at least on the paper. Maybe the implementation was still missing or was delayed. But I have the fear that there might be a change in policy making now. Uh, seeing the crisis, seeing that uh, um, also renewables will not immediately help you uh, getting prices down because they need uh, long-term investments and you have to prepare for that. 
So I mm -hmm. would be lucky uh, if we find situations where uh, the, the regional governments will prepare everything that we can say, yeah, this is a perfect case for our investments, then we will gladly invest. But I fear it will, stake, will still take time. Yeah? And in the, on the other hand, we have the old pattern ready to work. Yeah? So by retrofitting the coal power plant working for the next 20 years, it could seem like a good alternative right now in the times of crisis to ensure uh, a, an electricity production where also every policymaker in the region knows this is a way that works because I can still see a lot of reserve, a lot of doubts that uh, as energy system based on renewables like wind and solar will finally work and you will not end up with a, a lot of blackouts. Yeah? So this is why I was putting this on the table again and see there is the, the, the chance, at least, of an alternative policy choice. Thank you. Sonia, do you want to? Yes, maybe just to like add, um, it, it's true that the choices were made mainly to like reach 23, 25 targets before the war, right? So of course, like this year, a lot of things sort of got mixed. And I believe it's really important when we are discussing this to be quite clear that um, the short-term measures introduced are not fitted for the long-term goal. And um, here it where coal comes to play, especially, so I think we should all be clear in the messaging that um, it has maybe usefulness currently in securing um, or, or like maintaining security of supply, but still, I am, this is not the long-term solution. The long-term solution is to have enough capacities online, alternative clean resources, so the countries are not again in a situation where they need to secure their supply with uh, fossil fuels. And I believe I wouldn't necessarily agree that um, uh, coal uh, is still seen as, as the, maybe seen still in some countries as, as the main for baseload electricity. But uh, honestly, if you read the news, a lot of these countries are already importing coal. Apart from maybe Bosnia and Herzegovina, everybody else is already importing coal. Coal has uh, also a surge in the prices uh, from around, I think, 100 euros per ton last year to 400 or something this year. Like in August, it was more than 400 euros. And, and this is, again, paid by somebody. So this is, again, um, somebody needs to pay for this. And that's why I believe it's quite important when we are sending messages to the policy makers, to the decision makers, to the utilities, is that uh, the more you rely on, on fossil fuels, on coal especially, and um, we don't know if, when the next crisis will be, uh, the riskier it is that you will again uh, face either shortages or surges that you need to then cover from your own budget, and then your pu public deficit is, is increasing, uh, uh, et cetera. So, Looking at the short term, it's, 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 yes, how do we deal with the crisis today or, you know, to get through the winter, but then learning a lesson from that in order not to repeat the same um, uh, mistakes again. Wonderful. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Yovan, for breaking the ice. We now have panelists from the public joining us. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Did I, uh should promise you hear me yes uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, in this fishbowl it's the first time I'm in a fishbowl I will um, your time <laughs> uh, I'm Kori Udovicki from the Center for Advanced Economic Studies in Belgrade and uh, this discussion and also this morning's discussion has inspired me I hope to be very brief to in a way put an additional angle to our recommendations, which are indeed numerous, but a few of them actually boil down to, I think, the same broader message, which is, yes, it's a matter of a policy choice. Let's say that that policy choice was sincerely made, and let's even say that the circumstances haven't changed, and that uh, policymakers still want to implement. Still implementing uh, the energy transition is a very complex process in which most of the allies and the gains are in the future and most of the opponents have very clear interests against. What I really think we need more of, and some of the recommendations clearly say that, 
is an involvement, more than an involvement of a civil society in winning hearts and minds, is a development of greater capacity of the civil society to handle such complex issues. In theory, and in the principled European accession process, uh, this should be done by the governments. The European accession was about governments that agree and believe in what the European Union wants, and the whole preparatory process for European accession was about adjusting policy-making mechanisms to fit into the EU. This is not really the reality right now with us anymore, or maybe it never was. We need a civil society that receives long-term support in being able to bridge the friends and the enemies or the opponents of a transition and they need to be able to deal with very complex processes. We need to be able to bring businesses to a meeting like this. Right now, very few of us would be able to bring truly relevant businesses to a meeting like this. And working through governments that are often captured is not going to get us there. What we need is a direct engagement with businesses and with the mediators, which would be some kind of a more developed civil society in relations with business community than we have right now. Wonderful, thank you. I'm sure the organizers noted this as well. Anyone else want to take a chance? I'm giving my seat. Yes, okay. thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so let's then um, start wrapping this up. Let's go with the... Oh. I think, uh, Mr. Butler wanted to oh. say something. I'm sorry. Can't see that. Well, actually, my next question is directed to Dr. Busher, but... Thanks a lot. Um, I just wanted uh, to come in at the discussion that was uh, taking shape here. Somehow the question is on the table whether we will see a renaissance of coal in the region or a renaissance or maybe a, a starting through of renewables investments. I'm a bit more optimistic uh, in favor of the renewables, evidently, because um, what the government so far have been dealt with as uh, a minor issue, the energy transition, the reaction to the climate crisis, maybe they have been burying their heads in the sands, um, is now really on the top of the agenda of uh, all the leaders and it coincides with the price crisis. And the reason for that is in the Western Balkans mainly that we had a uh, modernization gap and that is not even only related to renewables, but uh, to all energy sources. Over decades, nothing has been invested. And I think um, everybody from governments to companies uh, to all other stakeholders realizes that we need more investment urgently. And as the things are as they are, investments in the 21st century can not be anything else but green uh, that comes from the financial sector, um, it comes from uh, pressure from the European Union and other stakeholders, uh, CBAM, uh, we already discussed, etc. So I think if we get the framework right with all the elements that have been mentioned and recommended, um, including all the incentives and all the instruments that the European Union uses as part of its uh, Green Deal, also in the uh, Western Balkans, then we will A, see a wave of investment because it's desperately needed, and B, this wave uh, will be in green technology. So I don't think um, that a renaissance of coal um, is a sustainable one in the business uh, sense of the world. And uh, I think we just need to make sure um, that we use the dynamics of the current uh, crisis, as we call it, to transform it into not a renewables or a boom of renewables investment uh, per se that's going to come, um, but a fast one and a smart one as well. Thank you, but please uh, stay with us for a second uh, because my next, next question was to you anyways. Uh, finances were mentioned quite a few times uh, during today's uh, panel and it's hardly a secret that energy transition requires uh, lots of money. We also talked a lot about regionalization. So would um, a functional regional platform be a way to overcome this issue? Thank you. Um, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by a regional platform. 
Um, I think we have, um, especially now, and uh, it has been also mentioned uh, that uh, President von der Leyen announced uh, more money to be uh, made available for the countries, uh, some of that short term, some of that uh, rather regional and uh, in the longer term. Uh, what is what has been good practice, um, but maybe not good enough in the past, now needs to be taken more seriously that um, all these investments, all this support, um, public support, is being conditioned on concrete progress in reforming. And uh, there, I think it is important to link it um, to policies and commitments that the Western Balkan countries make by themselves. The national energy and climate plans, for instance, are a good, uh, if they are done right, um, they are a good tool um, to list uh, the targets, the policies and the measures that governments intend to take. Um, and if support available could be linked to the fulfillment of these targets, policies and measures, I think we would move already in a very good direction where support is ma being made available, um, but not without commitments, not necessarily additional commitments, but more detailed commitments, more concrete commitments, and evidently also commitments that are being lived up and are not just uh, being put on paper. Thank you. Um, Ms. Holman, um, I want to come to you with another question, please. Um, we saw um, on the video that we watched um, that four administrative com capacities are mentioned. And you said that the governments or politicians understand and mention energy transition. So I was wondering, uh, in terms of the division you had, what's the perception of the Western Balkans capacities, including our governments, politicians, CSOs, et cetera, in handling the energy transition and energy security matters? Um, my impression is, and without being an expert, um, that there, it is also an issue of capacity because it is very demanding, this mm. uh, sort of transformation, this comprehensive change. And we see this even in other countries, also in my country, that this is a challenge. So it's not surprising that for smaller administrations, um, that is also the case, especially um, administrations that have to focus on, on many reform areas at the same time. We have the EU enlargement process, um, um, four of the Western Balkan countries are already negotiating, uh, two others sort of striving to do so. So there are many, and, and at the same time also um, other issues, political issues in the region. We have in Kosovo and Serbia, we see also um, a certain um, um, sort of amount of capacities being absorbed by bilateral differences, also on energy issues, um, uh, which um, of course is, is, is a pity. Um, and in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have very many um, issues at the moment uh, which are holding the country back. So this is certainly a challenge. But uh, we believe uh, that this is nothing which should um, sort of um, 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 stop or be a reason not to move forward with this agenda. There's also help available, um, be it from the um, European Commission, I guess also the, the energy community. There are lots of um, bodies, institutions that can give advice. Also Germany, with the, um, especially the GIZ, with our economic cooperation, we are heavily involved, like many other countries. Um, sometimes we also um, we send experts who, who 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 can also go into the administrations and help and uh, give advice. Uh, we have lots of uh, bilateral projects. So there's if there's a political will to to enhance the capacity, I think there are possibilities to do that. But um, uh, very decisive is a political will um, um, in the respective ministries and also at the top level. To, to make um, uh, that a priority. Thank you. So, Mr. Steska, talking about these, or assuming mm -hmm. the capacities are lacking, what's the alliance approach to new members? Yes, well, of course, I mean, we don't expect that everybody is top-notch ready. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say that our approach is that we are there to offer the needed support in, in sort of bridging that gap in where the countries are and they, where they want to be, especially when we are talking about the cool phase out or the cool, cool to clean transformation of their, of their power systems. Um, just to end, um, because we're right at our time, in any case, 
that there is support out there, there is financing out there. Um, and um, it's not, not to only focus maybe only on the region, it's really like, as I said, it's a, it's a global issue and you can find illiship in many places, so whether that's banks, other finance institutions, um, different platforms like our platform, like the Just Transition platform, etc. Um, but uh, yes, I would just encourage and say that we need also the feedback from, from the, the um, elites leading these countries as well uh, in order to, for us to also to understand what is needed and how can we really improve, let's say, what we are doing and our support uh, in enabling uh, accelerated co phase out. Yeah, comes down to cooperation, right? Yes. <laughs> um, Mr. Shalay, let's uh, give business voice. Um, again, one more time, uh, because um, this is a matter of cooperation between public sector and business sector. Uh, would you say uh, the CSOs in these recommendations um, had some blind spots? Are we missing something? I have to say that I was quite happily surprised that all what you put in the recommendation is exactly what also the business needs. So I don't see here any misalignment or missing spots. And I would be happy if we can create also, let's say, a new uh, environment, a business environment, where we are not only discussing with the policymakers and the governments, but also with the civil society, because I think that's what needed uh, in order to give these projects also a really long-term life perspective and not we, we don't want to build something where we feel the, the local people are against that. And we also want them to let participate. So we are often discussing what is the share that we can also leave to the people there. Um, like uh, this could be in the form of a contribution that we pay for every kilowatt hour that is produced. So these are schemes that are already developed and we highly uh, recommend also to apply that in, in the West Balkan countries. And still, um, there is also a big potential, as was already mentioned, and I fully agree, especially for the underdeveloped areas. Uh, there, uh, this could be really a driver for new, mm -hmm. uh, a, a new perspective. Yeah. So we are talking about uh, the mountainous areas where I find really good uh, wind speeds mm -hmm. and where we can um, also develop large-scale projects because the uh, people's density is quite low. So in contrast to many other European areas where we often find a lot of yeah, different interests fighting with each other, I think here in the Western Balkans, we can really find spots where we have to comply with, uh, with uh, uh, let's say, environmental uh, conditions. That's for sure. But there is a lot of uh, potential and a lot that we can develop and which will contribute to Europeans' energy, energy transition uh, on the whole scale. So this is also why we as a company are quite active in the area with big projects. And I think this is really also the future and we should work on that. Wonderful. Also just the perfect optimistic ending to this panel discussion. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.